Joy to be here with you today. I'd like you to grab your Bibles and get on over to Matthew 9. <clears throat> we have been blessed, my wife and I, yesterday and today. Thank you for taking such good uh, care of us. Yeah, I enjoyed spending yesterday up at the couples conference uh, with, with you. I had a great time, and I mentioned this a few to, to a few of you, but I, I, everybody was ready to go yesterday. I mean, people were happy. People were ready to play some games and just enjoy some time with each other and enjoy time in God's Word. And it was, you just hit the ground running yesterday. I, I loved seeing that. I love seeing happy Christians. That's a joy. That's a blessing uh, to me. And you, you've got that here. You've got a very happy church. And I'll, I, it's an encouragement. You say, well, we've been to some churches that aren't happy. Yeah, a couple. <laughs> and uh, so I, I like being around happy Christians, that is a, that's a, a joy. And one thing, too, I love the way, um, to, at least, um, I'm assuming it's like this every Sunday anyway, I love how uh, the teamwork that was there at the couples conference, uh, people working together to, to really uh, bring off that, that goal. And then here today, and seeing even young people right up here singing, there's, I didn't have the guts to get up and do something like this the way some of these young people did when I was their age. That's a blessing. Uh, to me, it's an encouragement. You keep it up. And they got half the church over here playing an instrument, using skills like that. That's so fun. That's neat to see that. What a joy uh, to be encouraged that way. So thank you for being a blessing already uh, to us, my wife and I. I've, my wife, Christy, uh, here, we've been married 16 years this year and, and uh, serving the Lord um, as an assistant pastor for a while just outside of Seattle. And then six years ago, uh, God called us down uh, just south of our state capital in Washington, south of Olympia. Uh, some towns called Centralia and Chehalis, we call them the Twin Cities, and I-5 runs right in between the two of them. And this May, we'll be celebrating our sixth anniversary as a church, and very, very thankful uh, for God's hand there and uh, ha having a part. We're in the building right now, actually, of, of a middle of a building program. We're building a sanctuary uh, right now. Uh, last, but a little over a year ago, we relocated, uh, bought a building, and we've been trying to phase in the, the sanctuary um, uh, without, without any further debt, just trying to do it with the cash in hand. We're, we're almost halfway through uh, with that in, a, in about a year's time. And I'm very, very thankful uh, for that. And to God be the glory. It's great to see him save souls, see people baptized, and uh, him build his church like he promised he would do. And uh, we're trusting him for that. We have four children as well, three boys and a baby girl that was born seven months ago, seven and a half months ago. And uh, so they're a blast, uh, a lot of fun, love our children. Love my wife. Thanks for bringing us up here and allowing us to be with you for the couples conference. And then it's a great Sunday. God loves you Sunday. He does every Sunday, not just this Sunday, but all the time, right? But we're going to emphasize God's love today for sure. And I'm so very thankful for that. Matthew chapter 9, and look at verse number 35. And um, I'll read down through uh, verse number 38. You can follow along. As I read Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Father, it's a joy and a privilege right now to be able to gather around your word and worship you uh, this way. I'd ask God that you would help our hearts to be the, the right kind of soil. Maybe there's baggage, maybe there's... Um, preconceived ideas that are brought here today. Maybe our minds are just so wrapped up in the thoughts and concerns of this world, and they're still there. And Lord, we need you to arrest our thoughts, bring our attention here, help these scriptures to uh, just penetrate our hearts. God, that uh, we could go away rejoicing in a compassionate Savior, a God who does love. And we know this, that your grace transforms us from the inside out. And maybe there's here, someone here today, and though they've been in attendance plenty of times before, they've never been saved. And today, uh, they need that, a fresh look at Calvary, a fresh reminder there. And we pray, Father, for souls to be saved, for the saints to be encouraged. And may you get the glory in all things. 
In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 And you may be seated <clears throat> this morning. <clears throat> 90 feet tall, 1,300 feet above sea level. There's a statue that overlooks the city of Rio de Janeiro down in Brazil called Christ the Redeemer. Maybe some of you have been there. Maybe you're like me. You've just seen pictures of it. It stands, its head alone is nine feet tall. It, from tip to tip of its hands that are spread apart like this, 63 feet. And as he stands there looking over Rio, a city at his feet, at the, at the foot of the statue of over six million people. And off of that lush green mountainside, the city of over 6 million people descends into the crystal blue Atlantic. But the eyes of that Redeemer, if you were to maybe get out a telescopic lens and look at him, there's some things, some ironies that stand out on that statue called Christ the Redeemer. The Christ the Redeemer statue, one of the things, the ironies that you'll see right away is that the eyes seem sightless. And you think, well, of course, all statues have sightless eyes. But in most cases, when, you're, when, in a, when a person is carving out a statue, where the pupils are, they actually carve little circles there to indicate sight. But on Christ the Redeemer statue, there's no circles indicating sight. He's overlooking a city of six and a half million people at his feet, and he's staring off into the horizon almost sightless, and almost as if the sculptor designed him to be that way. It's quite ironic. I read Christ the Redeemer who doesn't see the multitudes. So if you were to take that lens and go down a little farther past the prominent chin, you'd find another irony. On the outside of the cloak, there's a, a heart, a valentine-shaped heart. Not made of compassion and not built out of love, but made out of mortar, stone. It's cold. Quite ironic, isn't it? Christ the Redeemer standing, and instead of seeing the multitudes at His feet, He stares blindless off into the horizon. And with no compassion, just a stone-cold heart. The symbolism is ironic. Now you got to ask yourself, what kind of Redeemer is this? Eyes that cannot see, a heart that cannot love. And the answer to that question, what kind of Redeemer is this? It's exactly the kind of Redeemer that many people have. A, compassion, a, a Savior that cannot save, a Savior that cannot see. We treat, we make up a Jesus of our own imagination, one that we're comfortable with. And he comes across more than, more, not like the Jesus of the Bible, he's more like a, a, a lucky rabbit's foot redeemer, like a, a good luck charm redeemer. And hey, his specialty is getting you out of a jam. You need a parking spot? Just rub the redeemer. You need help on a test? Just get his picture out. Hold him in your hand while you're taking the test. His specialty is making your dreams come true. And then this is the best part. When you don't need them, put them back in your pocket. No need for a relationship. No need for love. No need for service. No need for sacrifice with a Jesus like that. What kind of, people, what kind of a redeemer has a cold heart, sightless eyes? Again, I'm telling you, the kind of redeemer that most people have, that we work with, that we go around with, maybe some here today. He's a lucky charm redeemer. For some, he's like a let's make a deal redeemer. Jesus, I'll put on a suit and tie for 52 Sundays out of the year. And in exchange, this is what I expect you to do for me. But if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, I'm going to stop coming to church. And if you don't make these sort of things come across, if you don't give me the power or the influence that I need to have, then I'll show you. I'll just stop reading my Bible. I'll stop praying. And so the kind of Redeemer that cannot see, the kind of Redeemer that does not love, Sorry to say, many people hold on to such a redeemer, and they call him Jesus. He's just not the Jesus of the Bible. Amen. For some, he's like a genie in the lamp. You know, his specialty is just new jobs, new sports cards, new and improved spouses. Your wish, just rub the lamp. He pops out. What do you need? Just tell him what you want. Three good wishes, and he'll go right back in the lamp, and when you don't need him, just discard him. Kind of like a spare tire. Just get him out when you need him. And then, you know, when he starts, if he ever has any sort of demand, just put him away. No sense for love. No sense for commitment. No sense for that. Who cares? I just want what I want out of life. And it's up to him to grant it to me, right? This is where we go wrong. 
See, this is not the Redeemer. This is not the Savior of the New Testament. He's not a lucky rabbit's foot. He's not a four-leaf clover. He's not a genie in the bottle. He's not making a deal with you today. He is a Savior that doesn't have... He's not heartless. He's not a Savior that cannot see. He is a Savior that has a heart. He is a Savior that has compassion. And He is a Savior that sees you exactly where you are today. Even the things that you think are hidden, He sees. Jesus Christ sees you. He sees your pain. He sees your struggle. He knows your hurt. He sees you fainting under the loads of burden. He sees your fears as you face your future. Simply put, we could say it this way. God loves you. His compassion, number one on your outlines, compassion reaches to the aimless. In verse number 36, Jesus sees the multitude and they were scattered. No direction, they're just scattered abroad. A sheep having no shepherd. Aimless people. Who, who are you following today? Who do you follow after? Who are your role models? What kind of posters you got hanging in your room? Who do you follow after? What books are you reading after? Fads change. People change. People may let you down. People will stab you in the back, leaving you bobbing in the wake of their own ambitions. Fads change. People change. Trends change. What's healthy today wasn't healthy last week. You ever get those articles up here like we do down in the States? One week chocolate is bad for your health, going to kill you. But the next week, just wait, because there's another article coming out. Chocolate's good for you now, <laughs> especially like dark chocolate. Yes. So you cut those ones out and put them on your fridge. <laughs> the ones that come out of chocolate's bad for you. Ah, just wait. It's going to come out again. Chocolate's now good for your health right now, okay? So just go eat it up. It's Valentine's Day. Go do something good for your health. Chocolate, yes. Hey, things change. Trends change. Fads change. People change. I was looking over some of the photos that you have back in what's called the Harvest Baptist Memorial Room or whatever back there where we had the, the men's class today, right? There's trophies in there. There's photos in there. Some of you look different. Yeah. Things change, man. <laughs> Cars get old. Houses get old. You get wise, all right? <laughs> you smarten up. We smarten up as we get older. We become classics, right? And there's a, a fable that's told of an old man who was taking the donkey to market him and a, his younger son, and they were taking their donkey to market, and they went through the first village on the way to market, and the townspeople began to mock him, saying, what a fool, why don't you ride the donkey? So the older man gets onto the donkey, and they ride, and they get into the next village, where the townspeople again mock him. What a cruel old man making that young boy walk. Why don't you let him ride? So they change places. They get to the third town, and the townspeople mock the son. How are you making the old man walk? Why don't both of you ride the donkey? So they both got onto the donkey, only to make it to the fourth village. They get into the fourth village, and they were indignant. They were outraged. Animal cruelty! Two people on one donkey! The old man was last seen carrying the donkey <laughs> to the marketplace. Aimless. We follow what people think of us. We mold, we shape ourselves to whatever whim the world throws at us, whatever the, whatever's cool at school, and we've got to go along with that trend and that fad. Jesus says when he saw the multitude, that's exactly what he saw. People that are being cared about with every wind of doctrine. There's no stability. They are just chasing fads. They're trying to impress people, but they're not trying to please God. Paul lived such a life like this. I love his testimony. It's in there in your outline, 1 Corinthians 9, 26. Paul says this, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Yes. Okay? I want, to, I want to try to illustrate this verse, but I need some brave volunteers. Probably younger. The younger, like maybe this size. You got any volunteers? You're not scared. I'm a nice guy. I won't hurt you. I'm looking in this section because this seems to be like where they're all primarily sitting. Okay? <laughs> Do you do this on Sunday mornings? We have like living volunteers. Is that okay? I'll come pick you. How, how about, I'll, you got a tie on. Okay. What's your name? Uh, Ariel. Ariel? Can you come up here and help me? Yeah. Okay. Now this is what I want you to help me with first. Okay. I'm, I'm going to have you race somebody and I want you get to pick who you want to race. Oh, you want to you race? Okay. He was raving at you. You want to race him? <laughs> okay. Come up here. Come up here. Okay. You guys are going to go. You guys are going to race here. Line up. Okay. okay. Here we go. All right, on your mark, get set, go! 
You're supposed to go that way. Did you hear what he just said? Where do we go? That's the point I'm trying to make. They had no idea where they're going. I just said go. They took off running. That's what boys do. And who cares? We're just running, all right? All right. Now listen to what Paul says. You go back to that verse. He says, so run I with what? Certainty. He says, I'm not just guessing where I'm going in life anymore. He used to. But he's got direction now. He knows where he's going. He's not running with uncertainty. He also says he fights. All right, you guys ready? All right, who wants to fight today? <laughs> okay, all right, you guys can be seated. But watch this, watch this. When Paul says, he says, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. All right, you got up in Canada, it's like Boxing Day, right? Is that a big deal? No? All right, some guys are like, yeah. Some, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means up here, National Boxing Day or whatever. I've heard the violence goes up on that day, though. Is that true? Yeah, anyway, okay. So Paul says... He fights not as one that beateth the air. If you've ever watched any sort of boxing uh, match, I've, uh, I've not watched a lot of boxing, but I still have never seen this, okay? <laughs> they introduce the guy standing in the, you know, the blue corner and the red corner, and then they go ding, ding, ding. I've never seen a guy close his eyes and then <laughs> just start swinging, hoping he lands the punch. <laughs> I've never seen a guy do that. But look, this is what Paul's saying. He says, so fight I, not as one that's beating the air. A fighter doesn't just go out there and start beating up the air. <laughs> a fighter gets into the ring, and you see them. They're moving around. They're bouncing back and forth. What are they looking for? They know exactly where they want to land that punch. And they're just waiting for the other guy to let down his guard just a little bit, and then he wants to land that punch. He knows what he's aiming for. Paul's saying this, I used to be aimless in life. I used to have no direction in life. I'm just running all through life, and I was an angry, religious guy. Could there be any angry, religious people here today? Paul was. I was an angry, religious guy. I had religion. He had plenty of it. You could read his own testimony other time, some other time. But he says, now that I've met Christ, it's like I've got direction when I'm running this race called life. And my life, if I could illustrate it, it's like a boxing match, but this time I know exactly where I want to land my punches. I know exactly what I'm aiming for. His compassion, Jesus Christ, reaches to the aimless. Paul gives testimony that he is no longer aimless, but that he has purpose, he has a direction, and eternal value when it comes to the thing in life. And I can't help but think that if you were to take the Apostle Paul and put him at the feet of a statue, in Rio, Paul would say, who's that? That's not the Savior I met. Eyes that can't see me. A heart that's stone cold. That's not the Jesus I know. His compassion reaches to the aimless. Number two, his compassion reaches to the fainting. Verse number 36, Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, was moved with compassion. Moved with compassion on them because they fainted. <laughs> You can faint for a lot of different reasons. I've played basketball a lot, and I've played basketball to the point in time where I've almost fainted. I like to laugh. I've laughed so much at different times in my life where I've nearly fainted. I was going to pass out. Teachers get ready to call 911. I'm just laughing in class. I'm having a good time. I'm, my, I'm about to faint, and I know I am, but I just can't stop laughing. Life is good. I'm laughing. But that's not why these folks are fainting. You can faint for various reasons, but they weren't playing basketball. And they weren't laughing. See, 1 Samuel tells us that God sees not like we see. He sees on the heart. And so they were fainting, not from an external burden that they were carrying or in a job that they were doing, but internally, where we, the real us dwells, our soul, our heart, our mind. Jesus sees them fainting under the load of burdens that they are carrying. What's heavy on your heart today relationships that are a mess secrets that are on the verge of being discovered and you know it bank accounts that aren't where they should be or ought to be or used to be maybe missing money there's a burdens that people carry 
Our hearts are heavy. Don't you wish there was somebody who cared? Don't you wish there was somebody who would listen? Well, today I want to remind you you're in the right spot because there's a Savior who cares. Amen. His name is still Jesus Christ. And you don't have to take my word for it. Take the nest testimony of a lady back in John chapter number 8, frightened woman in Jerusalem who had the thoughts of a, a burden, facing even a death sentence, wondering if anybody even cared. See, as dawn broke that day, in the city after days of celebration. Morning sun could be shining through the streets. Kids were in the streets playing. Dogs were running around making noise. There were some peddlers out there trying to sell their wares. But also that day, there were some worshipers that had come to worship. That day in particular in the temple, there was a carpenter teaching. He's earned quite the reputation and some are coming to listen to him. We don't know what Jesus Christ was teaching that day in the temple, but whatever the topic was, it was quickly interrupted by a mob of religious, angry people. They came in, stormed the temple, interrupted the sermon that Jesus was giving with indignation in their hearts and a scantily clad woman in their hands. As they throw the woman down in front of Christ, they demand to know, the law says, stoner. We just caught her in adultery in the very act. The law says, stone her. What do you say? With furled brows and indignation on their eyes and their countenance and stones in their hands. The woman now laying there, maybe clutching a sheet underneath her chin, trying to cover herself up as she's looking through the mob, trying to see, maybe, is there any hope for me? And all she sees is tight fists. <clears throat> All she sees is red rage in their eyes. <clears throat> and in a <clears throat> attempt of desperation, her eyes go from the, their hands that are holding the stones to the face of the carpenter. But his face is different. He, he's looking at her different than the rest. Do you ever pause for a moment and wonder what was going through the mind of Christ at that time? Did he see her as he made her? In his thoughts, does his mind race back to that great big grin that she had when she first lost her first tooth? Did her, his mind go back to the time she was playing outside, fell down, scraped up her knee and ran home so her daddy could fix her knee up? Because this was somebody's daughter. Every sinner you meet is still somebody's daughter, somebody's son. Is this how Jesus saw her? And so Jesus takes the attention away from her, brings the attention to him as he stoops down into the sand and begins to write in the stand. But the religious leaders, they're not about to have this. They don't put up with this very long and they demand to know, Jesus, what do we do with this woman? What, how about we stone her? She deserves to die. So Jesus stands up, and as the woman is choking back her tears, Jesus says in John 8, 7, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. It wasn't too much later. In the silence of that moment, it was interrupted by a thud. And then another. As the rocks fell from the hands of these men, Thud, thud. And one by one, each of these men dismissed themselves from the very presence of Christ and the sinner. John 8, verse number 9. They which heard it began being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, being at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman... He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Listen very carefully. Go and sin no more. He wasn't making light of the sin. Neither was she. When he says, Hey, does no man condemn you? She didn't come back and say, Condemn me for what? I haven't done anything wrong. 
she was humbled. And as a humble sinner, she says, nobody condemns me. She understood she needed it. She understood what the law says. But she's just simply stating the truth. There's nobody here that's condemning me. Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You want to know what happens every time a humbled, repentant sinner comes to Christ? Seems like there's a few times in the New Testament where Jesus says this. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. See, you're here today maybe and you're thinking you're pretty good. You're okay. You're not like other people. The truth of the matter is you need to humble yourself just like this sinner did if you're ever going to know salvation in Jesus Christ. It's true that he is compassionate and his compassion reaches to the fainting. And just in case you don't take my word for it, why don't you listen to the testimony of a woman who, if we could travel through space and time, take her to the foot of a statue in Rio. This unnamed lady caught in adultery whose life now radically changed by a compassionate Savior. Stand there and listen to her testimony. She looked up at a statue with sightless eyes and a cold heart. She would say this, I don't know who that's supposed to be. That's not the Savior I met. That's not my Redeemer. He saw me. He knows where I was. This one can't see. This one has a stone heart. Jesus, His compassion reaches to the aimless. His compassion reaches to the fainting. And my question for you today is, do you know a compassionate Savior or do you only cling to a cold symbolism? Thirdly, his compassion reaches to the multitude. Again, back to verse number 36. It says, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. They were aimless and they were fainting. They were a multitude and he was moved with compassion. Well, how many is in a multitude? I don't know, but I guarantee you this. You're part of it. I don't know how many a multitude is, (laughs) but I know this. You're part of the multitude. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8 says, God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I didn't deserve that. I was a sinner condemned to die. I was a sinner at enmity with God. But God loved me. God gave his son. And while I had transgressed and I broke his laws, He died in my place. I was the one supposed to die for my sin. I was the one, just like that woman condemned to die. But a compassionate Savior, one day, 2,000 years ago, stepped into, became sin in my place. He died on the cross, paying for my sin debt. He paid for your sin debt on the cross of Calvary. They buried him in a tomb, but praise the Lord, he is not there today. It's an empty tomb. His compassion reaches to the aimless, to the fainting, and to the multitude. I could take you and introduce you to people in our own church family. I'm sure you could do the same here. Different different people in our church like Roger. When we first met Roger, in my own testimony, I've never met a more drunk man in my entire life than Mr. Roger. Today, right about now, Roger's in church. Roger checked himself into, I don't know how many hospitals trying to get help of his alcohol addiction. Shikshadal Hospital and everything in between, sobriety homes, all kinds of stuff, never, never, never got a cure. Roger met Christ. That was years ago now, probably close to four and a half years ago. We met Roger when we were out just door knocking one day. He answered the door drunk. Today, Roger's a blessing, man. It's awesome to see. Roger is saved. Roger was baptized. He's a member of the church. Amen. Today, after church is dismissed, there's going to be a group of people going to a nursing home led by a guy named Perry. When we first met Perry, Perry was homeless. He was living in a park in a cardboard box. Today, Perry leads up the nursing home ministry. He also goes to what's called the Eugenia Center. Everybody who's going through uh, drug, um, what do you call it, drug court has got to go to the Eugenia Center where different people show up. Perry starts showing up there, and he just preaches Christ. This is a state-run facility. You're not supposed to do that in a state-run facility. So they tried to tell Perry he can't do that. They sat him down. They said, look, we appreciate you coming down here. He goes there, and he spends three hours telling his testimony 
and trying to point people to Christ. And so we appreciate you taking your time. But from now on, we don't want you talking about Jesus. Perry says, if I'm not talking about Jesus, I got nothing to talk about. They said, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on. So you're not going to come back? He says, well, no, if I, not if I can't talk about Christ. Guess what they're still letting him do? Amen. He still shows up and talks about Christ. There's just testimonies of the radical life changes that God can make. By the way, I'm so thankful. Those are great testimonies, but you know what a better testimony is? A young child that comes to know Jesus Christ that never even knows what it is to have a drunken moment in their life. God saves them from that. Amen. They don't know what it is to be high on drugs and live in homeless in some park somewhere. What a testimony. Some of you young people that are growing up in church, you never take this for granted of what God can be able to save you from. You might have a testimony where at a young age you came to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Praise the Lord. That's the best testimony to have. How Jesus Christ can save a soul, and he still can. Why? <laughs> because God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I don't know how many is in a multitude, but you're in it. He died for you. He died for your sin. Today, what would it take for you to agree with God? God, I'm a sinner. I can do nothing to save myself. I understand you sent your son he died. He shed his blood. He was buried and rose again. And that fact alone is the only thing in the world that can save, my, save me from hell, save me from my sin. No longer will I trust me. I'll begin trusting him. Have you ever made that choice? How about today? You get that settled. I'll close with this thought. My left hand is a ring. It's a symbol. And though it may not be elaborate for us, it's priceless. It cost a, quite a bit of money to a college girl about 16 years ago, and Christy and I were married. The wedding ring I have on my hand, it's a symbol of our marriage. It's nothing more than that. If I were to lose the ring, which I thought I've done a few times, I went out looking for it along sides of roads and stuff like that, eventually found it in the dryer and stuff like that. If I were to lose the ring, I was disappointed. But it doesn't mean we're no longer married, okay? It's just a symbol of, the, of our love. What if I were to take, though, the symbol and to make it more than what it was ever intended to be? What if I was to take the symbol of our love, this wedding ring, and what if I were to go out and I was to cheat on my wife and I was to abuse my wife and I was to neglect my wife and I'd provide maybe for the needs of some other women in our community but not my wife's needs? And eventually that catches up to my wife and Christy comes to me and she says, I can't believe it, Tim. You're no husband to me. I'm leaving. And what if I responded this way? What are you talking about? I'm still wearing the ring. I've never taken it off. It's still on my hand. Do you think her response to me would be, oh, <laughs> what was I thinking? You're still wearing the ring. I'm sorry. Sure, you don't love me. Sure, you don't take any time for me. Sure, you don't have any commitment towards me. But you do have the ring. Will you forgive me? That's not how she would respond. No, she's telling you, she said, she said this, she said, amen. <laughs> That's not how she would respond. And yet this is what we do. There's somebody here today, you've got no commitment to Christ, no relationship with Christ, no love for Christ. But you say this, I got baptized two years ago. Hey, 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 don't, no, 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 no. I know where you're going with this. My dad, he's involved in ministry right here. My mom, she plays one of those instruments over there. I'm good. You're trying to make a whole lot more out of the symbolisms instead of the Christ. We join churches, we get baptized, we go, hey, wait a minute, every Easter rolls around and I take communion, I'm okay. And you've got no relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't love him. You make no commitments. You make no, you've got no relationship going on with Jesus Christ and you're simply holding on to a cold symbolism. And today, friend, that needs to change. That needs to stop. Many substitute contemporary symbols, a picture, a symbol in your wall, and a cross hanging from your rearview mirror, perhaps baptism or communion, church membership, and we replace Jesus Christ with all these symbols, with all these pictures. God, I know I never think about you. I know I hate people. I cheat my friends. I abuse my body. I don't take care of my spouse. I blaspheme your name. But hey, I got baptized. 
Yeah, I'm rude, I'm cruel, I'm mean to people, and I'm nasty, I'm violent, I love vile entertainment that drags your name down, that blasphemes your name. But hey, I'm okay, because I'm, I'm still planning on being there on Resurrection Sunday, and I'm planning on having communion service next time, so I'm okay. And you've got no relationship with Jesus Christ. See, if we were to take Paul or that lady caught in adultery, and we were to take him to the mountain there, on Rio, where Christ the Redeemer statue stands, they'd say, who's that? That's not the Savior I met. But today, what if we could take him to a different hill? What if we could take him to Calvary? What if we took Paul and this lady to Calvary, and there in a bloody mess, Jesus Christ crucified and hanging on a cross, and the woman now with tears in her eyes would say, that's him. I recognize the hands, the only hands that day that didn't hold the stones. I remember him. That's him. He's my Savior. He's my Redeemer. And the voice of Christ on the cross, though raspier than the day that the Apostle Paul heard him on the road to Damascus, though raspy, Paul's listening as the Christ says this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Paul would say, that's him. I know the voice. I recognize the Savior. That's Him. And their lifestyle of commitment and devotion and love. We love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. And there's something that is generated in the heart of every genuine, born-again child of the King. That says this. It's not good enough for you to hold on to some cold symbolism. Worship Him. Love Him. Sacrifice. Serve Him. God loves you, period. And there's just something about that grace when extended to us as undeserving sinners that in our heart wells up and says, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? You say, well, that's not me. That's because you still think Jesus is a rabbit's foot. You still think Jesus is some lucky charm. You still think Jesus Christ is some genie in the bottle. Today, I plead with you. Lay down the symbolism. Forsake the symbolism. All the pictures that you may have. And I want to encourage you, come to the cross. Come to Jesus Christ, a compassionate Savior who knows exactly what sin you're dealing with. He knows exactly what pains you're dealing with. He knows exactly the aimless life that you've been living. And he can do something about it. And he, my friend, is the only one who can. If you're not saved today, would you choose Christ? If you are a believer today, how about you consider his prayer request in the very last <clears throat> verse where he says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. When his compassion touches our heart, it helps us have compassion for the multitudes around us. With every head bowed and nobody looking around, we're going to have an invitation time.